a Faith at a Base podcast 064. Do I really need to be baptized the right way? Have you ever considered our tagline here at a Faith at a Base? It reads, Rethinking the Traditional Plan of Salvation. Now, I must admit this does sound a bit presumptuous, doesn't it? Hopefully the tagline provides a crisp clarity to the issue we're debating and anyone peaked enough to investigate this apparent arrogance discovers a warm and welcoming place to explore the age-old debate regarding water baptism. Now you know me, I gotta pick apart a term. After all, we need to agree on what words mean. Let's begin with rethinking. Why are we rethinking anything? Well, because we think we might have gotten something wrong or we need to review our understanding of a thing. In this case, the traditional plan of salvation. A plan is an ordered succession of smaller events leading to a specific goal and our plan leads to salvation. Salvation means a person receives the forgiveness of sins from God, is moved from a lost state to a saved state, and will enjoy the benefits of the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit and the promise of eternal life with God in heaven. Traditional means the plan is something which has been used and reused for a very long time and is assumed to be correct. Our process of rethinking leads us to poke holes in, to probe and otherwise scrutinize the assertions made by the traditional plan. At a faith at a base, we've discovered the primary and most glaring difference between the traditional plan and the biblical plan is this small, seemingly insignificant fact. Listen carefully. The only difference between the two plans is that the declaration of salvation is made at different points along the same common path. Let me explain because this issue can be a little hard to see. The plan of salvation is like a map. When we look at a map carefully, we spot two different exit ramps, and both are clearly labeled, this is the way to the pearly gates. To arrive at our destination, we must use the correct exit ramp. But right there on the map are two different exit ramps, both going off into different directions. The traditional plan asserts a person is saved when they first believe and trust in Christ. This happens at some point before water baptism. That's ramp one. The biblical plan demonstrates that a person is not saved until they obey the gospel, which includes water baptism. That's ramp two. Intellectual belief and acceptance of the gospel message and obedience to that message are two separate things and happen at different times along the same spiritual highway to heaven. The crazy thing is that if we're not paying attention, the routes look identical. When deeply committed Christian believers who have not yet obeyed the biblical plan of salvation hear about it, become convinced of its truth and want to obey, the question inevitably comes up, do I need to be baptized again? Now they're questioning this because sometime in the past they experienced a full immersion baptism and now they think they may need to be baptized again the right way. They made a sincere commitment to Christ and believed they had been saved, but that happened well before their water baptism. Our goal should always be to humbly obey the gospel to the best of our ability, right? Everyone who truly loves Jesus wants to please him. If we were baptized at some point in the past with a full immersion baptism, we should ask ourselves a couple questions. What teaching were we following and why did we get baptized? Let's jump in the Wayback Machine and review our thinking. How did our original introduction to Christ play out? At some point in the past, we heard the gospel message. We learned about Jesus' sacrifice for our sins. This, of course, is where and when everyone's journey begins. We recognized our sinfulness and our need for a Savior. We were ready for a change. We repented of our sins. We accepted Christ's offer of salvation. We received Christ. So far, so good. These are all biblically prescribed and sanctioned activities in response to the gospel message. But this is where the plans diverge. When we made that initial sincere commitment, we believed we were saved. We may have even known that water baptism would be an important next step 
at some point in the future. Now accompanying our decision may have been some really powerful and convincing emotional experiences. For example, we may have felt like the weight of the world was now off our shoulders. We may have felt tremendous joy in a sense that we had truly begun a new life. Now let's be honest, we were new to the faith and pretty naive. We made a commitment to Christ based on what someone told us. We had no clue there were actually two completely different paths. One claims you just got saved, and one says, great so far, now take the final step and obey the gospel in baptism. One path is correct, and one is not. One stops us in our tracks. The other urges us to continue and immediately obey Christ's command to be baptized. Now remember, the next step in both plans is indeed water baptism, so the plans can look super similar. These differences may seem subtle and insignificant. It may even seem like splitting hairs, especially to an outsider of our argument. But one path is right and one is wrong. One is the truth and one is a subtle and clever deception. When we first made our very real and very sincere decision, we were not aware there were two paths, and neither was the person who was teaching us. Now you know what? This is nothing new. Remember those good, hard-working, sincere believers of Matthew 7, 28 and following? This is the same issue they were experiencing. They made a solid decision to follow Christ. They were at a point in their spiritual life where they knew Jesus very well. They worked hard for him and called him Lord. But they were not saved. And this is shocking. Let's review it so it's fresh in our mind. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. This little story could leave us quite depressed, but thankfully, Jesus explains the problem so we don't make the same mistake. As he explains, it's not about how well they knew him. It's about him knowing them. He tells them he never knew them. Think this through carefully. There's a forensic timeline. Try this. Read the account carefully, following the plan of salvation, and sketch it out on a timeline. We surmise these sincere, hardworking people followed a really solid, well-presented introduction to Jesus and the plan of salvation. They heard the gospel, and that's step one. But the plan they heard must have diverged onto another path at some point in time, which did not lead them to the correct destination. They never arrived at salvation. Think about this carefully. That critical point of time had to have occurred after they heard about Jesus. This is obvious. Absolutely everything else in the story looks and feels exactly as it should for a solid biblical conversion. It's difficult to understand Christ's refusal to accept them. It's, it's stunning. When we wind the tape backwards, we conclude that some sort of error must have occurred right after they learned about Christ. Something prevented them from hearing a vital bit of information contained in the rest of the story. Now, these are not the only people in the Bible to experience this problem. I suspect God knew we might have a difficult time accepting these people as lost, so he included a sequel. Yeah, there's another case of this happening in the book of Acts. This is exactly the situation with a fellow named Apollos. Let's read it. Acts 18, 24-26. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and they explained to him the way of God 
more adequately. Apollos had the same problem as the folks in Matthew 7. He knew accurately about Jesus, but did not know about obedience through the baptism into Christ. In fact, just like the people of Matthew 7 who were actively promoting Jesus, we meet Apollos while he's on his own personal mission trip. We, we catch him in the act, so to speak. He is doing one of the exact same things Jesus said those people were doing, preaching about Christ. Acts 18.26 He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Now, don't miss the language used in verse 25 right before this. He taught about Jesus accurately, but knew only the baptism of John. Let's understand this. Luke, the author of Acts, makes a comparison between two things. Apollos has experienced the baptism of John the Baptist, which is very obviously a water baptism. But he did not know about the baptism of Christ, likewise a water baptism, and thus the comparison. Apollos has not obeyed the gospel. If he was teaching the gospel adequately, there would have been no need for Priscilla and Aquila to have him over for lamb chops and explain the way of God more adequately. And that, of course, is the exact same situation as our friends in Matthew 7. They obviously knew Christ, but Christ says he never knew them. The big takeaway from all this is it is possible to know God, but God not know us. That's tough to swallow, but that's the truth. Not convinced? There's more. Here's a fascinating scripture from Galatians. Listen carefully. Galatians 4, verses 8 through 9. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you're turning back to those weak and miserable principles? Knowing God and being known by God are completely different things. I know all about the President of the United States, but rest assured, he does not know me. If we were baptized in a church which teaches that salvation comes before baptism, it's important to understand that is not the biblical plan of salvation. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you know I made a sincere commitment to Christ and prayed the sinner's prayer when I was about 22. That's what someone told me to do. They never opened the Bible to show me anything. I said the prayer and considered myself saved. Years later, I was shown the biblical plan of salvation and quickly repented and obeyed it because I knew, based on the scriptures, I had been wrong. For over 10 years, I believed I was saved, but I was not. When I saw the truth, I was eager to obey. I, I wanted to be right with God. Now, please understand something. The second time around, it was not a person who was telling me what to do. It was the scriptures. I read the Bible for myself. I made a decision based on scripture, not the same old sinner's prayer confession I had previously followed. Someone showed me the scriptures and asked me if I had obeyed them. I said, no. On January 20th, 1985, I stood in the waters of baptism and said, Jesus is Lord. This happened after I had repented of my sins, and I knew I would mean what I said for the rest of my life. The older I get, the more I understand just how lost I really was. After this, my life changed in indescribable ways. Now, there's another subtle point of discovery in all of this, which I think is important to understand. I was not saved by simply changing doctrines. I did not, at one point in time, believe baptism was just an outward sign of an inward grace, and now that I understood the doctrine correctly, my original baptism was somehow magically valid. I did not at one time believe people were saved when they accepted Christ, and now understood things correctly, so I was good to go. We don't clean up a little doctrinal error, and now everything is fine. Let's not fall into that deception. An incomplete or erroneous gospel saves nobody. People are lost because they have not obeyed the gospel, regardless of any religious experience they have had or have been participating in, maybe for years. Here's why. Repentance always precedes salvation, right? Sometimes we need to repent of things we've done. Sometimes we need to repent of things we have 
believed. Sometimes we need to repent of things we have taught. And without repentance, no one will be known by God. Erroneous beliefs are sort of the black and white sins we repent of, just like the technicolor sins of adultery, lying, stealing, and as always, salvation follows repentance. If I have believed, followed, and taught an erroneous plan of salvation, it certainly did not save me or anyone I taught. How could it? An erroneous plan is no plan at all. So this is not a matter of just patching up some erroneous doctrine and slapping a new coat of paint on it. It's really not about doctrine. We're repenting of something we were doing wrong and obeying what we learn is right. This is a matter of facing the truth that we are still in a lost state and repenting of the things which have brought us here. Is it hard to believe that God may be revealing new truth to us? Really? Do we really think we've figured it all out? I sure don't. For some, this is incredibly difficult to accept, and I completely understand that. Some really great people have spent years serving the Lord and have experienced truly amazing things. They've known joy, peace, patience, the thrill of introducing people to Christ, and more. They've given their time, money, sweat, and sometimes their blood for the cause of Christ. To even consider the possibility that they are not saved is pretty crazy and honestly, maybe even a bit offensive. But step back, think about it. Let the scriptures guide us. Are we really absolutely certain that those good folks who had dedicated their lives to the cause of Christ back in Matthew 7, 28 were really lost? Do we want to waffle on that? Because of that story, we know it is possible for someone to be in the same position. But when we think of ourselves in that position, it raises red flags and warning lights because we use our spiritual resume as our defensive proof of salvation. But isn't that exactly what the believers of Matthew 7 did? Their protests were all about their past experiences. And isn't that exactly what our dear brother Apollos did? No, nothing like it. His reaction was far different and exemplary. We see no protest from Apollos. We just see the church rejoicing and sending him on his way to continue preaching that Jesus is the Christ. He didn't argue with Priscilla and Aquila. He accepted the truth and obeyed it. How do we know he obeyed it? Well, the church would never have endorsed his ongoing mission. Listen, Acts 18:27. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed. The church would have never approved if Apollos was still teaching only the baptism of John. He had obviously been baptized into Christ, which the church would have witnessed. This is why they were enthusiastically confident sending him off to a sister congregation. Now listen to me. Coming to the earth-shattering conviction that even though we have years of sacrifice and devotion to the Lord, we're actually in a lost state, did not suddenly remove Jesus from his throne. Nothing happened which shook the foundations of heaven. Creation did not come to a standstill in shock and disbelief just because we have accepted new truth. In fact, I hear the distant sound of applause. Listen carefully. Do you think God does not know or has not known what he has been doing regarding your relationship with him? Do you think he has not lovingly and patiently led you to this exact point in your life, preparing you, perhaps for years, to understand the things you are now learning. Do you think God has not been watching over you and protecting you and loving you enough to bring you to salvation, no matter how long it took? I'm pretty sure God knows what he's doing. God knows our hearts. God knows our past, our present, and our future. God sees the desires of our heart, and God knows how to lead us to repentance, even from bad doctrine. Our part 
is to accept the truth, to, to gratefully accept God's mercy and gentleness as he reveals his plan. In fact, if we really stop and think about it, we could be quite overwhelmed when we consider the gentleness and patience he has skillfully employed, leading us to this time in our lives. Our hearts should overflow with gratitude. No, no wait, wait. Can, can you imagine complaining that God didn't lead us to salvation the way we thought it should be done? Shall I whine that God should have saved me sooner or used some other way to do it? Do I, do I really want to pick that fight? No, we must never grumble. God just took too long to save me and I've been working for him so hard. Oh, now we understand the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Some worked a full day, others worked only a couple of hours, but both got paid the same wage. Here's the owner's response to their complaints. Matthew 20, verse 13 through 16. But he answered one of them, Friend, I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? Do we really want to be the guy who complains about how God conducts his business? I hope not. God knows exactly what it took to save me. And he knows exactly what it takes to save you. In reality, this is amazingly good news. From the first time we decide to make Jesus the Lord of our life until this time when we can now obey the gospel the correct way, God has kept us safe and sound, preparing us for such a time as this. Is it not amazing how God crafts all the experiences of our life to bring us, or anyone for that matter, to a knowledge of the truth. So, do we need to be baptized again, even though we were baptized as an infant or as an adult in a full immersion baptism? The short answer is no, you don't need to be baptized again. In reality, you need to be baptized for the first time. And immersion for the wrong reason is not Christian baptism. And hopefully, we want to do things the right way. Ultimately, it's your decision. But I can tell you that as for me and my house, we will follow the Lord, no matter how or when He leads us. We will obey the Lord, making sure that if and when any new understanding is revealed, we do not lean on our old understanding, and we do not rely on our spiritual resume. Our charge is to repent and believe the good news, and that kind of belief is a special kind of belief, a special kind of faith we call a faith that obeys. Well, thanks for listening and watching. Join the argument at www.faiththatobeys.org slash blog.